The content of this podcast includes topics that may be difficult for some people to confront or discuss. These conversations can be triggering. If you are underage, please speak to your guardian before continuing. We're walking around numb because every single time a feeling comes up, we escape, numb, or distract with, with something else. And if you have an addiction, that's the purpose of the addiction is to numb that pain. Welcome back to another episode of That's an Issue. And this week is something we've never done before. When we decided to make this podcast, we knew that we wanted to talk to tons of therapists and psychologists and just world experts in that field who talk to people, help them through it. And something that we wanted to do, once we got into it a little past 10 episodes, we wanted to talk to survivors, people who have gone through hell and back. Now, I must warn you, this is a very adult-like conversation. So if you're young, ask a guardian if you should be listening to this. It might be like awkward to ask them if you should be. And you read the show notes, you'll see why. But this is a conversation that we felt is very important. And our goal is to to help people, really, truly. Um, Obviously, we're we're only can help as so much. We're a podcast or, you know, you can watch us or listen to us. And if you actually need real help, definitely call Relief um, to hook you up with the best people to help you. But I think conversations flowing and going like this could be really helpful, could really help people tackle the challenges that they have. So this this week we speak to Ellie Nash, someone who gave a TED Talks on his porn addiction. This episode is great for anyone who has an addiction, is struggling, and we talk about what it means to really be addicted, what it means to to try to get past addiction, methods. Um, we obviously get nitty gritty with Ellie about his experience with pornography and this is an episode I, I I really think it's for anyone because in some way we all are addicted to something in some capacity whether we realize it or not and or or if we do realize that and we're like hey I just I need help in a certain way this is a really insightful conversation we know it's not the norm at least for me it's not what I was used to but I really believe that Ellie truly is someone that is so authentic and is really trying to think of like okay we have an issue i have an issue what could i do to really make an impact how could i think of this because if you keep on doing something and it's just not working what could i do and we we yeah we're we're, we're happy to provide this conversation to you the classics did a great job and i'm excited for you to listen to this week's episode again trigger warning Please speak to an adult before listening to it. Here's this week's episode. Mental health, relationships, those are loaded topics and something that affects every part of our lives. But we aren't having enough open conversations about it. And that's an issue. Okay, welcome back to That's an Issue podcast. We have... um, Ellie Nash, who is a guest on the podcast, and we are very, very honored to have him. He he actually fit in any one of Living with uh you know, ep, uh, podcasts. Whether it's Kosher Money, I know you have right. a successful business. Um, there's um, that's an issue where you know we're raising awareness for different mental health uh, issues, as well as, um, inspiration for the nation. Nation. Absolutely. I think you could, you could, you could check a full through. You could also do, uh, that's a, the song one. Um, (laughs) (laughs) have you written any songs? Um, and then there's, uh, Charlene. So yeah, um, we're, we're really, really, um, it's a real honor to have you here. Um, we know that, um, you know, you, you, you try to bring awareness for addiction and your story is really, really moving for a lot of people. So uh, perhaps you can share with the audience, you know, your uh, your um, your journey. My journey. My journey started um, in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, as uh, parents not being religious until they grew up, and then having a family in there that was religious. That definitely added a huge component to my story. For those who uh, grew up like that in Crown Heights, You're kind of on the outside in, in some regard. Uh, there's always the Balchuvas trying to. You know, become the from from birth, and um, all dynamics that played out in Crown Heights, from the physical 
safety issues, the race riots in the 90s, like all of that, I feel, played a very important role um, in my story. And uh, what I've spoken about a lot and kind of the theme of most of my talks really geared towards shame. And not because any of this is easy to me, not speaking, not, uh, not speaking publicly, not sharing things. I'm a private person. I'm relatively reserved. I'm not someone who's uh, running to, t to tell my story by nature. I did it because I s did the opposite for so long. Right. I've seen the benefits, more than the benefits. I've seen the need of doing it, especially when there's a stronghold of shame on a person. So an underlying theme, even, you know, the, the, the TED talk I did a couple years ago, we called Escaping Porn Addiction, which admittedly was um, a title used a little bit as clickbait. We figured we'd get a little more mm -hmm. clicks if we, uh, if we used that title. If I was being completely true to what the speech was about, it would be about, you know, eradicating shame. It happened to be, in my case, it was porn addiction, so I said that story. Right. But it wasn't really about escaping porn addiction as much as it was getting over shame. Now how does so, the shame, how does that work? How, how does that, like, what is the cycle of shame that, you know, anyone who is struggling, you know, through an addiction or anything? How, how does the cycle work? Is your question why shame is so corrosive, why it hurts yeah, us so and much? Yeah, and how does it, how does it fall feed into, into a loop? Right. Specifically regarding addiction or anything? Sure. Addiction, let's say. So... And I guess to give a little more background on my story and the elements of it that I've spoken about, growing up in Crown Heights, large family, all of that, um, feeling very other than, you know, wanting something that I didn't have eventually led me to seeking comfort in someone who was several years older than me. A teenager at the time, I was a young kid, eight, nine years old, and that developed into um, a, sexual, a sexually abusive relationship for about three years. Wow. And after that ended, um, it definitely changed me a lot in terms of my relating with others, trusting others. Uh, it's definitely one of the reasons I went to porn for comfort. It's not that my childhood was perfect before I was abused, but that way of resolving it, whatever I got from uh, that, that teenager at the beginning of the relationship, it clearly went sideways. And when that happened... It, I think it made more sense for me to use machines or computers or magazines to uh, to soothe whatever discomfort I was feeling. As that progressed, that turned into a full-blown porn addiction, and um, over time, pixels turned into people, and the porn addiction was much more than a porn addiction. How how, how graphic do we get, and that's an issue. You you can get as as we could get graphic. You can get as 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 whatever we need to go because we need to make sure that you know the issues are addressed and right. people get the right education. Yeah, I mean, it is fairly common, and I've, uh, I speak to a lot of people now with porn addictions. The, the nature of an addiction, unlike uh, someone who's using a behavior, addiction is always going to progress, right? Someone who is able to drink a glass of wine three times a week for 20 years is not an addict. They may like mm -hmm. wine, they may enjoy wine, they may even have a few negative effects from wine, but they're not an addict. The addict is always looking for more. So in the case of porn... It progresses. It progresses in frequency, intensity, and variety. And very often it progresses past the screen. And some of the questions become, hey, instead of standing on this side of the camera, what's from the other side of the camera, so to speak? And whatever that turns into, strip clubs, massage parlors, prostitutes, all of that stuff. And my addiction took me to, to all of those places. And bringing back to the, um, the shame itself, what I've, what I've found is that everything I know is from experience and reading books. None of it is uh, clinical. I know we have yeah. a therapist here. Yeah. And what I found is that that need to belong is, is quite literally a need. We, we need mm -hmm. to belong to something. And I guess, you know, within the Jewish community, we see that very clearly where there's a strong sense of community and it's something that we want our children to have and we want... It's, it's an important part of our culture and life is to have community, that sense of belonging. But sometimes we can have the community and we don't have the sense of belonging. And oftentimes that feeling that keeps us on the outside looking in, even when we're very much physically on the inside, but we're on the outside looking in, is that feeling of shame. And I heard Brene Brown, um, who likes to define undefinable terms, she, uh, she defined shame as the fear of not being worthy of connection. So I'm sure this isn't the only definition, but we can use... Um, we can use that definition for, for this discussion. And that fear of not being worthy of connection 
as it plays out, is corrosive in all areas of, of, of one's life. And then eventually with an addiction, there's, it, it creates a loop, which is, I don't feel good, so I'm going to do something that makes me feel good in the short term, makes me feel bad in the long term. And the long term doesn't mean necessarily years, the next morning. And then what do I do when I feel bad? So again, there's that disconnection, and especially when it comes to something like sex, where there's added layers of shame in our culture and society and religion around it, there becomes even more of a, a reason to disconnect or to feel disconnected. And then that, that loop just keeps going. It's like you, you almost can't even tell where it starts and where it ends. Like, why am I, why, am I feeling bad because of something else or am I feeling bad because I just watch porn? And what am I doing because I'm feeling bad? I'm watching porn again. And where is that taking me right back to it? And on, on, on and on we go. And as I mentioned, the progressive nature of addiction, it just, it's, it's not the same. It just keeps pushing and getting a little bit more dangerous and a little bit more, eating up a little bit more of our life. So hopefully that gave a good explanation of shame and how it affected me. Wow. Yeah, that was great. Um, First okay. of all, it's, it's yeah. amazing. I'm sorry, but it's yeah. amazing that you're able to come out and, and say these type of stories. You know, it's a, a lot of people would feel extremely uncomfortable. So it's a tremendous, a tremendous strength, and we really appreciate that. Just that you're you're able to do yeah. that. Like, I think that's humongous. Well, I want to be clear that it wasn't easy, right? For those for those looking at me and thinking that the first time I did this was an easy process, quite the opposite. It was very difficult for me. My first time going to th- a therapist. I parked a couple blocks away and really right just mm-hmm. thinking about going there and who's going to know and am I going to have to explain to anyone you know those few hours I was there yeah so it it didn't start naturally but what's interesting about shame and kind of the way it turns it on its head is that you know where does our connection and belonging come it doesn't come when we put a mask on right so if if I f- become accepted because I pretend to be someone I'm not then I'm still going to go home feeling Shame it didn't it didn't solve the problem. I may, the group may feel like I'm a part of the group, and I may have this from the outside. It looks like, or I have this feeling that may approximate belonging, but until I really take the mask off, I don't get that. So what ended up happening was, when I started sharing my story, then all of a sudden, other people who have the same struggle start talking to me, and especially when you're talking about porn addiction. I mean, it's. These are the most visited sites on the internet, right? Bigger right. than Amazon, right. bigger than Google. Like these are the sites that people are going to. I don't know bigger than Google, but it's, you know, it's it's up there. I think something like thirty three percent of the content downloaded on the internet is pornographic. Wow. So right. What did we see? We up. we saw some stats last night. It was like five million clicks a day or something like that. It's crazy. The videos uploaded a day. It was like some yeah, really big the, numbers. Yeah, if you're thinking about the yeah. videos, it's. Millions and millions of videos of porn, pornographic videos. I mean, and it's not for porn stars, right? So who, who, who is right? Who consuming, is consuming and making and like all of it, mm-hmm. right? On all ends of the, the industry, it's so many people, but a lot of it's done in secret. So when I started talking about it, I'm not the only one who was no, course, addicted. Right. So now, I'm truly connecting with another person. So it's not only that it, it's actually the antidote to shame. It's the that's that's Being the vulnerable. healing salve of shame. Being vulnerable, yeah. Correct, being real. And then someone else is able to be real, and now there's real connection. So the sense of belonging that I felt when I started going to 12-step meetings was like nothing else. Like, here's a room full of people who, you know, outside we're just like everyone else, right? Putting on the masks and doing what we're doing. But inside this room, we're all real for an hour. And I was like, wow, the feeling of connection that was created was powerful. And maybe some of the reason I talk is to see if I can create more of that feeling that exists in that there, room. Yeah, more of that in the world, yeah. That's great. There's so uh, much that you said I'd love to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back. Okay, yeah, but there's a lot of questions I have. So, well, I guess my first one is, how did you realize that you had an addiction? Right, because usually there's that denial piece. No, there was, and right, there's probably for a while. Denial. Yeah, for so, sure. So, I guess, what got you to that first 12-step meeting? Right. So, in my case... Um, there was a lot of denial around the addiction because classically when we hear the word addiction, I think most of us go to dr- alcohol, drugs, and gambling. Right. Right. So there, actually the science hasn't, um, isn't definitive on the fact that someone could be addicted to a process like sex or right. shopping. Is it in the it's DSM? Not that I know of. Right. I think, I think it's that It's like a, a lo- sexual dysfunction. It's not... Right. right. Not class. an addiction. Right. 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 So a lot of 
a lot of people don't even recognize that you could be addicted to this. So I stayed away from alcohol, drugs, gambling, and things like that. So f for me, it was almost my identity became that I don't have these problems. You understand mm -hmm. that? Oh, Meaning you went yeah. through things as a kid, and then you were like, but I'm not an addict, because I don't do this, this, and that. I saw other people right. around me, and I saw them using drugs, and I saw them gambling, and it was important to me. I started a business at a young age, at 19 years old, and you know, being a certain way was important to me. There was this corner of my life that was um, a real mess, but I tried to keep it as contained as possible. Unlike other addictions, sex really allows you to hide it in ways that you can't hide other addictions. When someone is drunk, you see it. Right. right? You see it. So, yeah, some people drink alone, but there's much more of an effect than someone watching porn for an hour in the room at night. There's much more an effect than... Like right, gambling, you lose the, the money is, right? <laughs> right. You're, you're losing money your money. Right. Drugs, I mean, it starts affecting people physically. Right. And the, and right. the risks and everything else, it spills out much more. Whereas sex addiction, I find that a lot of the people I know who are sex addicts, the rest of their life can function. Can sometimes overfunction. Oh, often overfunction. The amount of very high functioning people that I've met doctors, lawyers, uh, professionals, business guys. It's not to say that it isn't the case with other with other addicts, but it spills over in ways. Uh, other addictions spill over. Right, in like ways. about like Tiger Woods, right? Correct. He had he was an amazing golfer, pro athlete, and and he he I don't know if he had an addiction, but he definitely was struggling with something. Definitely seems to be the case that there and was some sort of sex addiction or something else. And there. that kind of goes to your point, and he w he was able to be you know put that into a corner. Like if that was an alcohol addiction. He may right. not be able to play as well the next day. Yeah, very often. Most people that I know who've gotten around to admitting that they have an addiction, which is where this question started, it came from an exposure. Right? Unlike, let's say, drinking alcohol, which may come from being hospitalized or may come from a bar fight or may come from an ulcer, a stomach ulcer. There's, there's more that can go wrong. With a sex addiction, it can live for a long time until there's exposure. Right, something happens with the, an arrest with a prostitute, or you know, cheating on a on a spouse, and those things spill over. It's it's not always yeah. There's obviously there are risks associated with it, STDs and things like that. But it's not nearly as it doesn't hang out nearly as messily as some other addictions. So in my case, I didn't think of myself as having an an addiction at all. When I the very first problem that kind of surfaced. And I'm not looking for this conversation to be only about um, sex addiction or right. even addiction right. because, you know, that's my story. But I think anyone listening just thinking about the areas of our life that we need to work on right. uh, could benefit from this conversation and uh, where I'm going here. So f the first area that got my attention was business. What happened was, is you know, I def as, as I mentioned, I felt a strong sense of being other than growing up and wanting something more than I had. And it became clear to me that, you know, making money was a solution, at least on the outside, to a lot of those, whatever it was I was feeling. And I saw that the people who made the money had the influence, respect, had freedom, ability to do things. So that became a major drive for me. So for the world to get my attention really was in that area first, right? It was, okay, the in a money area. And what ended up happening in my case was that as I made money, I lost it in different ways. Oftentimes, not being able to say no, people ask me questions, wanting, asking me for a loan or asking me for an investment and me wanting to say no, but just unable to. And I very, very much felt like that. I think people who struggled with that level of assertiveness or being able to assert themselves will understand what I'm talking about. It's wanting to say no and just feeling unable to say no. And after that happened a few times and being so frustrated about it and seeing that, hey, if I don't get a handle of this, I'm going to lose a lot or everything. I mean, it can just keep going. So there's so many bad investments and so many loans you can do that you don't get paid back before you lose everything you have. So I went to a therapist who I had heard that he worked in businesses or something. Like I, That was the way I, oh, he can help me in business. And when I walked in, he said, you know, what's, what's going on? I was 23, 24 at the time. 
my business was growing, but as I mentioned, I had this problem of loaning or investing in things that I knew had no chance of succeeding or getting paid back. And I told what I told him, the way I worded it, I actually remember, I said, there's a disconnect between my mind and my mouth. <laughs> my mind wants to say no, but my mouth says yes. And he asked me for a couple of examples. I share the examples with him. And he says, can I ask you a personal question? And I said, sure, and that's why I'm here. So he said, were you, were you sexually abused as a child? Wow. Like, whoa. So first I was, whoa. I was like, I said, yes. How did you know? And he started explaining to me how, you know, the patterns fit and it's just a feeling. You, you, you know, you start having instincts over time, being a therapist and working with people and certain patterns of behavior fit certain life stories or life events. But after I left the session, I wasn't so convinced. I was like, no, he probably asked that to everyone. <laughs> yeah. So that shock, be- and, shock and awe. Yeah. No, I just, okay, probably goes through a checklist. Were your parents divorced? Were you sexually mm. abused? Like, let me, hit the, let me hit the big ones, and I'll just work it into a conversation. Right. So my next few sessions of therapy kind of became all about that question. Like, was, it, was there a reason you asked me specifically, or was that just a general question um, you asked? And when he finally convinced me that it was specific to me, that I was dealing with something that he was able to pick up on because of the fact that I was abused or enough people who were abused had those patterns, I said, okay, then I got to focus on the abuse. I got to heal that. So as I started focusing on the abuse and the way it affected me and you know, the way it affected um, my trust issues, my... Oh, my sexual template. I mean, so many different things. My desire for relationship. At that time, I had no interest in getting married or having a relationship. It made no sense to me. I didn't understand why anyone would date or get involved in relationships. I had all right. these ideas and thoughts that I could pontificate on and explain, and they made a lot of sense <laughs> to me at the time. You know, so marriages for lonely people. I had all these things I would, uh, <laughs> I would say. And maybe now I still have things I would just say. <laughs> Right, but at least I feel better today. At least right, I'm smiling right. over there. I was depressed with my thoughts. So as I, as I started going, like, kind of pulling that thread on the abuse and working on those issues, eventually he sent me to a um, those a different therapist. That, like They just meet you to do a test. Maybe you can help me with the name of those. Okay, like an evaluation. Yes, okay. for evaluation. So Rorschach tests, mm-hmm. MMPI-2s. Uh, a number of different things. I remember sitting all day doing tests. Like filling so why? Things. Why did he have you do that? Why did he... Do you know why he sent you to that person? Um, I do. I, th- I think it was a combination of things, but he said that I didn't neatly fit into um, certain boxes that he's seen. Um, and then there was some stuff specifically around um, ideas I had around sex and things like that that mm-hmm. he felt... He didn't tell me that till later. He just told me, hey, I want you to meet this guy. And I said, okay, like, I'm signing up to this process. If this guy can help me. I was already feeling a little better from the first few sessions of therapy. So if he recommends to go there. But he let me know afterwards those two reasons. Was A, that I wasn't neatly fitting certain boxes for, for him. Like patterns that he's seen. He felt like I was maybe sitting in kind of two definitions of things. However, he, he does his work. And the second was certain ways I described sex concerned him in some way so he sent me to um a therapist one of those what do you call it evaluator yeah okay so he sent me for this evaluation and i didn't see the evaluation until years later seven or eight years later he eventually showed it to me but at the time it just went to him and one of the things it said was that um personalities like mine could end up with sexual addictions or you know sexually acting out behaviors or something like that so he started asking about that, not telling me it showed up in the report, but he just used that report to kind of guide his therapy. And he gave me a book by Patrick Carnes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Patrick Carnes. Patrick Carnes is, yeah. he's the, um, he's probably the first very well, well-known therapist to go out on a limb and say that sex, someone could be addicted to sex. And in many ways, he's the, as far as the 12 steps and sex addiction is concerned, he's kind of the first, mm-hmm. he's kind of the leader. So... Maybe in the Jewish community, you can compare with like an Abraham Tversky, mm-hmm. right, oh, who was right. the first to kind of step mm-hmm. out and say, hey, we Jews have addiction too, and <laughs> <laughs> right, we can look at this. So he did that with sex addiction. 
And he, he wrote a book. I'm not sure if it's his first book on the subject. He has a number of books on the subject. But he wrote a book called Out of the Shadows. So my therapist gave me that book. I read it and just gave it back to him. He said, this doesn't, doesn't apply to me. It didn't land. Oh, wow. wow. And, and at that time, although I was engaged in all these behaviors, I had never tried to stop. I had no interest in stopping. So um, to me, it was something I was doing. But yeah, there were when I was younger as a teenager a number of times I stopped I would try to stop watching porn or things like that there was a lot of the religious associations right. with right. it but at that point in my life I was like okay what I'm doing I'm comfortable with I didn't have the religious hangups anymore and I had no real reason to stop it right this way I was the way I looked at it but it did plant a seed that didn't complete they didn't start to grow I didn't see it start to grow until maybe four or five years later when I got into a relationship and had a period of bliss at the beginning of that relationship, the it's not that relationship, it's the woman I eventually married. She's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but for that first two or three months, there was this little bubble we lived in. And it was one of the only periods in my life that I didn't, I, I wasn't going to watch porn. I wasn't thinking about it. I just, I was in this little bubble with her. But at some point in time, we had a disagreement and that discomfort led me to wanting to watch porn. But this time, it's like, hey, is porn cheating? And, you know, I get into that mm-hmm. whole thing. And very quickly, that question became just whatever, right? Just it, it snowballed. The, the feeling right. wasn't. I, I started experiencing that real spiral, the spiral of wanting to stop, not being able to stop, the shame, the demoral, demoralization of loop. not being able to stop, that, that loop, right? Which before, yeah, I didn't like, I didn't want to do it, but I accepted it on some level like it's okay i'm managing it and we have all our rules right anyone who's uh, a good addict has their boundaries so to speak oh uh, i i never i never go to a strip club during a work night or something you right. know? So i'm never right. past 11 it's all these things right. Right? until they're broken and then until there's the broken, next rule exactly. right right so it's like we're always pushing it but at that point in time i had these oh it's not really affecting my life i never watch past 9 a.m never before 6 p.m whatever right all the uh all the beautiful rules we have, right? And then eventually people, the first drink in the morning is alcohol. Right. But at, at the beginning, we all have our rules. Right. And only with people, right? On and on. So when those started being broken at the beginning of the relationship, I went back to the therapist. And I said, give me that book again? Yeah. 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 That's, right. that's where it started. From there, he introduced me to someone, one of his patients who was in 12-step program. You know, he was... 30 years older than I was. He was married 15 years. His wife had caught him cheating. So I was kind of able to see the progression with him of where this can go and how it can affect people. And this guy had adult, I don't know, adult, I think teenage children at the time, and they knew and it was affecting his relationship there. So for me, it was, you know, I can take that path and, you know, be where he is with a secret for a bunch of years and eventually all the shame and problems with, coming out or I can do what he's doing today which is lean into the 12 steps and that's that's how I got there wow wow super inspiring you know in our community we have you know this is a very very taboo topic in the sense that it's not spoken about in certain you know organizations or certain communities as um, as we're doing now um, so if if you were able to talk to someone in high school, right? Who, and, you know, the statistics are strong that to indicate that it's common in in, in all types of backgrounds. Um, h- how would you advise someone who, or, or like a, someone like as a school psychologist, as uh, my wife is, or someone who's in a, an authority to be able to help, you know, young kids um, with this knowledge and awareness? Like, how would you advise them to do to help uh, educate? Right. So I've I've wrestled with this, you know, when I speak. Um, I've spoken sometimes for teenagers or for schools, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I'm like, hey, if I go into my story, am I introducing them to something they don't know? Or, or um, you know, am I addressing an issue that's actually there? And what if I'm right 90% of the time and you introduce it to one kid who didn't know? I'm fairly certain at this point it's so prevalent that we just have to assume everyone knows. I mean, the, yeah. the, the possibility that 
someone hasn't bumped into it is so low. And even if it's not, what is porn? What does that mean? Like, what, what, what does it mean, porn? Right, explicit. Like, porn is nudity, but what about all the erotic images that are in society that can be on, on billboards? They're meant to stimulate. They're, right. they're meant to be titillating sexually. That's the idea of the picture. And they do. I didn't start with porn. I started with catalogs, the lingerie sections and, and catalogs that came through the mailbox in my house, the same ones that my mom and sisters were shopping from for their clothing. But there's a reason they put them in there. I was a sports fanatic, so I subscribed as a teenager to Sporting News and Sports Illustrated, mm-hmm. and once a year the swimsuit edition showed up. Right? It's part of a society and culture in one form or another, right? The sexualization of people, the sexualization of women. And at this point, I just assume that, you know, I won't go in, I say, too far. As you saw at the beginning of this conversation, I asked, you know, how far I should go with it. But I... I certainly assume from a porn perspective that someone is, is dealing with dealing with it. And then, you know, my approach always is if it's working for someone, God bless. Right. Meaning if it's not turning into an addiction. No, it's like, not turning into What do you addiction. mean by working? Like I'm not here to make a, a an I'm not here to take a moral stand on Right and say no. Not, I'm, not that right. I don't have a moral position on it. I'm saying that that's not my that's not my role. That's not my job is to take a moral a moral stand on it. My job, I'm looking at it for those people who it's not working for. Can they talk about it? Can they get out of it? For those Bringing who already awareness. decided that it's not, I, I want to free the person who's already in the prison but isn't comfortable. I mean, who, who already recognizes in the prison? Right. Right. And there are so many people like this. I can't tell you how many people, young, 15, 16, 17 years old, have reached out to me and said, "Like, I, I want to stop watching porn. I don't know." I don't know how. And unfortunately, a lot of the messages, and this is where I think that um, if, if if we don't understand what's really going on, a lot of us get it wrong. So obviously, you have the occasion, right, the, the glimpse and all of that stuff, right, that someone who's, who sees an attractive woman or sees an attractive picture, they're going, to, they're going to look. But when we talk about someone who's going there for it or watching pornography on a regular basis very often they're they don't want to be there or very quickly they don't want to be there there is a sense of shame or a sense of innocence that gets eroded and pornography is not i mean it's graphic and it gets very very graphic very quickly and a lot of it's it's harsh and it takes an adjustment to be able to even consume correct it's not it's like watching the ufc Right? The first time you see someone punch in the face, you're like, what? You turn right. away. Yeah. Right. The same is true with a lot of this pornography. And a lot of young kids have seen this stuff. You know, they've, they tried doing a study on the effects of pornography on the teenage mind. I don't know if you've come across this. Yeah. Yeah. And they weren't able to find a control group. Right. You know, they did yeah. not have. Yeah. 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 We were, yeah. They we didn't have. You know, for those, you need to understand what a control group is. A control group is people who've never right. seen porn. Right, you have to. Right, they have nothing to compare to. Nothing to compare to. We didn't. We didn't know how someone was affected because we don't know anyone who has it. Right. What? So, what age do you think we need to start talking about this with our kids? I, I mean, can't like, say from the religious kids. community, but I think the average age is between about eight and ten that most kids get exposed right. to it. Right. I think we saw ten. Right. Ten to. We were yeah. We were looking up some stats last night, and we saw ten as an age that that's a lot when, of kids are that's exposed. When they, that's when kids try to look for. That's when right, that's, right, that's what it said. It said well, they can be right. shown by someone else, an, an older kid as well. Right, 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 so right, right. Maybe a 13-year-old kid shows an 8-year-old. The first time I saw an image of sex was a kid a couple years older than me who had just learned about it and showed it to me in an encyclopedia and showed me some, some pictures of a book in his parents' house. So it can start then, but at that point, when I was 8, it was 1993. Right, know, right. right. Now you have a smartphone. I mean, it's, it's a completely different, um, different, different world. But... What I was saying earlier was that very often when I hear people, when people reach out to me and, you know, it's often after they've reached out to, to, to someone, maybe a Rebbe in their yeshiva or a parent or something else, and oftentimes the instruction, especially from those of us who are more religious, is one of, you know, religious um, or moral opinion. Like, that's not okay. Right. Like, you understand what... You know, they'll learn Shulchan Aruch with them and, and how bad right. it can be or so on and so forth. And that builds the shame. Very often. Mm. Very often it can build, very often it can build the shame. And uh, I'm thinking of a story a few months ago. I did a, I had a conversation with Rabbi Yossi Jacobson, yeah. which right. went back three, and forth. Three-hour conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I did listen to it. 
<laughs> went back and forth on the name, and he actually advertised it in both ways. In some areas, he called it the shame of porn addiction, and some of his, you know, his followings in different communities, he felt like even that may be too harsh. He called it shame of addiction. And we had, we had a conversation around this, and after that, someone reached out to him saying that uh, he, was a, he was a teenager, and he said that uh, he's really been struggling and he feels like Robbie Jacobson is his last hope. So Robbie Jacobson forwarded me the email and he says, what would you say wow. in this situation? And I said, if I get an email like that, I get on the phone with him. So he said, can I, can I, can I pass them on to you? So I said, sure. So I speak, to the, I speak to this kid and I think, if I remember his story correctly, I think he had become from or more from when he was a teenager. But at that point in time, he had already, when he was like 13 or 14, I think at this point he was maybe 17 or 18, and he had already been exposed to pornography at that age, and he came across a video on YouTube, he said at about 14 years old, of a Sephardic rabbi talking about Shmir Sabris, or whatever the language they use um, in that community for it is, and just ridiculously harsh. And he said the shame he felt, he, just, he felt so useless after watching that video that it's kind of stuck with him since. And over the years, every single time he's, um, every time he slipped into porn, that video has kind of, like, he's reminded right. of and that- what this guy said. And just very harsh, very judgmental. And I don't think it came from a bad place. He just thought, maybe I'll scare this kid from going. Well, that's great if our way of getting pornography was going to a porn- corner bodega and pretending we're 18. But now it's in your face, literally. Right. When basically, right. what you're saying is that, that we need a certain, uh, we need to advance the, the, the education and how we, we uh, treat folks who are struggling with this. Right. The, fear, the, fear. the fear aspect is not going to work. No, because they're going to hit it. Right. They're going to get there at some point. So that fear and shaming, instead of preventing them from going there, the question is they're most likely there in some capacity. Right. right. So if someone has gone there once, what do we want our message to be at that point? Right. So when I spoke to him on the phone um, the first time, he kept referring to himself as disgusting. Wow. And I, mean, and I said, why, why disgusting? Like, what kind of, what are you watching? <laughs> so he's like, I'm looking at, I said, looking at what? You're looking at beautiful pictures of beautiful people. Like what is, you may not want to do it. I'm not saying you should do it, but what's disgusting about this? Like this is normal. This is normal. You know, right, said, he normally turned, he it's instinctual. He's disgusting. Mm-hmm. He is disgusting. And he said that every rabbi he's spoken to, well-meaning and well-intentioned, just turned it on him. And how disgusting it, and how negative, and the punishments and everything else. I'm like, it's not disgusting. I said, it's a, it's a very healthy drive that you want to channel towards something. Right. Right. You don't want to mm-hmm. be with your wife and not, and eventually you get married, you don't want to be with your wife and not be engaged and interested. And, right. Right. What you don't want is for that energy to be right spritz all over the place for lack of a better word but right. you don't want to get rid of it it's not a disgusting yeah. thing mm. right it's just uncontrolled that's at the moment correct and he had a really hard time with what I was, with with what i was saying but how can you say this and he had all the quotes and all the the rules that were being violated and everything else and in, in the conversation with robert jacobson this is a lot of where we went mm. but one thing's for sure is that messaging while it may have worked in the 1950s or 1850s or at some point in time, i don't know if it worked or didn't today's day and age where so many of the exposure rate is so high that that messaging message. much more compassion may not work. Yeah, you, you've gone there, okay, right. and now you don't want to. So let's support him. Let's build. Let's let's build him up. And give him the tools or her the tools to be able to, uh, you know, recognize that there is a people that have done this before, and there are ways to be able to avoid doing that. Yep. The, I like the, I like that you said her by the way, because there are <laughs> there women. Are. There are women who deal with this. It's not. Right. Uh, only a men's issue. Correct. Right. Yeah, Do women ever women. reach out to you? Yes. Right. Yes. Not it's not a, the numbers are not as high, but no, but it's there's still an there. additional level of shame that exists mm. for sure. And I, I I don't usually go too far down the path, but there are a couple of women I know, like in the conversations, but there are a couple of women I know who've worked on themselves in this regard, and I'll refer to to oh. speak to them. But in this case, where I ended the conversation with him was I said, you know when. After you're watching porn, you heard a muster speech on YouTube. Every time you went to anyone afterwards, you've gotten a muster speech. So now every time you watch porn, you get a muster speech. So let's try something else, right? right. I'm going to give mm-hmm. you a chizuk speech. 
mm. right? On, I said, to me, I'm very impressed. At 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, that you even care about stopping? It, didn't, it wasn't until 10 years later in my life when I was already hurting other people, right? right? When, when my wife or girlfriend at the time felt somewhat betrayed by what I was doing. Or maybe not somewhat, felt betrayed by what I was doing. That's where, I, that's where I was. That's what took to get my attention. This kid's 18 years old. I'm like, I'm inspired by you. Right, right. It takes a lot right. of guts. The fact that you care about this, the fact that you're paying attention, you want to change, you want to be better, like, you're a hero. Like, you're the best guy in the world. So, I, I, so I, I said, in, when's the last time you watched? Before this, this last time you fell? Like, when, like, two weeks. I'm like, two weeks is freaking amazing. Like, <laughs> you know, so... At the end of the conversation, he was having a hard time with it. Like, how can you say it? I, I was nichshal, you know, and he had all the language. And I said, I just I have a question for you. At the end of the conversation with me, are you more likely to watch porn or less likely to watch porn? Right now, how are you feeling today? You feel less likely to watch porn today or more likely? He said, less likely. I said, after you replay one of those muster speeches in your head, more likely to watch porn or less likely? He said, more likely. So that's all you got to know. Mm. So he said, so, <laughs> he said, I, so I should it. lie to myself so I don't watch porn? <laughs> whatever so okay clearly we need another conversation right, to undo the, the, the muster speeches but that's the main message I would have in answer to your question is we need a much more compassionate message and we can't be scared of what we're offering I think that a lot what, of us what do you mean by that meaning if, if we feel Judaism is real like we shouldn't be afraid of a taste test like don't be afraid if, if we don't have to be worried about someone going there and um like, meaning, what are, we, what are we saying? If we give a more compassionate message of it's okay, we understand, it happens, that someone's going to, maybe someone will hear that and be more inclined to go there. Well, it actually doesn't have right. that much to offer. Right. That's the truth. So if you feel that Judaism has a lot to offer and that way of life doesn't, then don't be afraid of a taste test. Like, that's not, right. if you think Coke is mm -hmm. a good product, don't be afraid if someone tries, tries Pepsi. Your worst, the worst thing that's going to happen is maybe someone won't be as afraid to test it out great but they're going to they if, may have if your been product exposed. Is, yeah, they, also they may have, have been, been exposed right, anyway we're definitely losing more in this direction i'm not saying it's foolproof but we're definitely losing more from the harsh message right. than right than from the other way can i okay let me also ask about some of the underlying reasons that a person would be turning to porn right so you're saying this feeling of discomfort or like what, what's the Musser speech inducing, right? Like this harm, the shame feeling, right? So like besides for, I don't know, I guess we're packaging all, it all as shame, but like there's other, I guess, mental health issues that right, are I mean, underlying that need to be worked through if the addiction is amounts. really gonna, like they're gonna conquer the addiction. Right, definitely in extreme amounts, right? So the underlying reason someone watches porn i mean the first time is because we have a sex drive right but no one's going to go there that often just because of a sex drive right i i remember having someone also a younger guy call me from yeshiva saying he spoke to a bunch of rabbis about this and you know similar it was chabad rabbi so he didn't get as harsh of a message but it was also harsh and he said he just couldn't stop watching porn he's spoken to a bunch of people about it and he couldn't stop watching porn and again i'm inspired because i didn't speak to anyone when I was a teenager about this. So these guys, 21 or 22, who are beating themselves up, I'm the perfect guy to call because I'm like, dude, you're my hero. Like, it's <laughs> awesome that you started so early on this. So I asked him, I said, why are you watching porn? He said, what do you mean? I'm a guy. So I said, okay, so you think that you're going there and I'm a guy because of your sex drive. That's what's motivating you to go there. I said, I don't believe you'd have, you'd run into a problem that you're talking about just because of your sex drive. Meaning at some point in time, you're going to say, I, can't, I don't want to do this. Meaning you're, you don't want to do it. You're calling me about this. You've spoken to a right. number of other people. The sex drive isn't going to keep Propel pushing you. you. Keep right. pushing it's not, you in that it's not direction. enough. The first time, the second time, the third. But yeah, but to you get know, to it's that place. Right. 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 Once you know it's also self-harming, right. that drive should be overshadowed by the knowledge of the harm that it, you don't want to do it. Or Correct. That. So mm. the fact that there's more energy to continue doing it. It would be like saying, I don't know if it's an exact example, but with alcohol, I, I wanted to relax. But it's not so relaxing for you. You ended up in a hospital. Like It's relaxing for maybe the other four people who were with you drinking, but it's not, it's not for you. So, okay, the sex drive is going to get you there, what, once a week, once a month? How often is it going to get you there? It's not going to get you to the point of saying, I'm never going to do this again, and then you're going back. So what's that about? So he was having a hard time seeing where I was coming from, so I just asked him, tell me when it was the worst. Tell me all the periods in your life when you've watched the most porn 
and tell me what maybe what's most recent because it's not easy to reach out to someone you don't know send me a facebook message to have a conversation like what just happened right before that message so almost as if he was disconnected from the person who told me two minutes ago that it was just a sex drive he said to me that he had just come back like bain has in between yeshivas he was spending a lot more time at home and there was a lot of stress in the house i'm like so the stress in the house like arouses you like what does it do <laughs> <laughs> what does it do to you and then he understood my point like of course it wasn't a sex drive it was stress driven right that's that that's yeah. what it that's what it was that was that was causing it so i can speak in my case right what what the feelings what the feelings were um, I found that almost uniformly the most the deepest emotion that um, many of us feel when we go to porn or that I felt was a sense of loneliness. And the shame connects very well to it. I, I mentioned that. Loneliness is often most felt around people. When we're alone, we're alone. So like, it's normal to feel alone. But when we're in a room full of people and we feel so alone, that feeling of, lonely, of loneliness... The only thing I found to anesthetize it for brief periods of time, it started a little bit longer, but for brief periods of time, was pornography. And the solution for me was not so much to focus on the pornography. Yes, I had to put distance myself, distance between myself and viewing pornography because it created a numbing effect on me that I couldn't really feel what I was feeling. But once I put a distance to it, then those urges came back, very intense urges. And at that point in time, there was nothing to fight. I just had to address the underlying reasons. And the underlying reasons, in my case, a lot of it related to loneliness or low self-esteem or you know different stories I'd created about myself or where my life is going and addressing each one of those and kind of picking them off and you know removing some of the harsh edges around it so it doesn't have the power to... Influence. You know, to throw me off. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's not that they're not there. I can... You know, there there still are urges. I spoke on the on the conversation with Jesse Jacobson, where it had been years, but I'd watched porn for the first time in in four and a half years or so. It's not that it's it's not that it's completely gone. It's not eradicated. I know that a certain level of stress, till this day, a certain level of stress still gets me thinking. There still gets like my mind will go like, oh, maybe that will still work. Almost like a old program. <laughs> right. Just, I was like, oh, you're stressed. I have a tool that will work, and it will work, but it'll work for like ninety seconds, <laughs> and then and then I'll be right back. So you start developing tools to address it. What are some of those tools? Awareness is big, just knowing where you're at. You know, I was speaking to someone the other day, and I said, you know, some of, sometimes we get on the train, and we don't even know we got on the train. And then other times we get on the train, and we see ourselves getting on the train. And that's, like, that's the awareness factor. That's step one. So, yeah, it could be the train of um, maybe a storyline in my head, you know. Someone's single for a long time. They go on a date, and again, they don't like. Man, I'm never going to. Okay, I'm never going to meet anyone, and that feeling sets in. So you just got on a train, right? I'm never going to meet anyone. That's a train. That's like, you know, desperation, despondency, whatever, right? Some sort of giving up or resignation, and that train, whatever we want to call it, is a dangerous train to be on. You stay on that for too long, you're going to end up in your addiction. So step. There was a period in my life where I just got on those trains without even noticing I was on it. There I am in the, you know, in the resignation train. This is the train, too. Right. <laughs> it's a train to hell, but we don't even know we got on it. We just, the story kicked in. The Land feeling terminal, to take but... over. So the step number one is just the awareness. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm off. So in, uh, in 12 steps, they have, you know, step number 10, they call it continue to take personal inventory and when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. In layman's terms, it just means check in with yourself from time to time because usually it takes some time for it to build up. If everything's good, it's a small blow is usually not going to throw you off. But, you know, it's not the little dirt that makes us stink. It's like a few days of, like, just dirt accumulating and it's not taking a shower that suddenly no one wants to be in a room with us. So that, that's where it's at is noticing at the end of the day is like, hey, i got to take a shower. And checking in on a regular basis that allows us to have the awareness like, oh, wow, that really threw me off. That conversation really threw me off or that really triggered me. And then from there, there are many tools, whether journaling is a huge tool for me. I have an app in my phone that dates back to 2012. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yes. Ten so years what is ago. It like, like, you journal like daily? I used to journal daily. Now, no. But if there, now if there's strong emotions coming out, I've found that the pen or 
Timing is just a beautiful way to get that. What app is that? Get that out. I use my W days, but it's my wonderful days. And just what's really cool for me about it is being able to read old journal entries from if I'm feeling, sometimes you can get a feeling like, wow, nothing's, you end up in a situation like, wow, I'm here. I'll give you an example. When, when I watched porn again about six months ago, right? So what had happened, and I shared about it on Yossi Jacobson's podcast, a friend gifted me a VR headset. And I stopped watching porn or trying to stop watching porn in about, at around 2013, I think. Wow. So I've been on this journey for a while. And even though I've slipped a number of times during it, I'd never got to experience VR porn. <laughs> <laughs> so I was curious. I was curious, and this thing sat there, and I was checking out some of the other things. And the, the guy gave it to me saying it's amazing for meditation, believe it of all things. <laughs> and the thought crossed my mind when he gave it to me, like I shouldn't take this home. But I couldn't shake it. And a few days later, there I am, you know, watching porn on it. And a thought that came in is like, wow, like, I'm such a farce. Like, I talk about porn. Like, here I am watching this stuff. Like, who the hell am I to talk? Like, should I delete everything? I got to call the TED guys to take everything. <laughs> like, who the hell am I? And it had been years that I, you know, not that you can't, you sometimes bump into stuff, but it had been years that I intentionally went to, right. to watch pornography. I'm like, whoa. And then the, another feeling is like, well, I'm not getting anywhere, right? All my work and I didn't progress, right? You can have that kind of Train feeling thought. sets yeah. in. And that's definitely been a, a loop in my head that, that can, like one of those things that can get me is like, wow, all this stuff and I'm not progressing. And uh, all I got to do is read old journals and wow. see the stuff so I wrote in 2012, 2013. And you're like, wow, it's a different guy. Like the stuff I'm dealing with. And yeah, there may be one issue that's still persistent, but by and large... It's not the same. And I think anyone who's on the path will see that. It's an awesome idea. So, And then talking to people. you got to talk mm. to people. got to talk to people. Like, I almost think of it as energy, right? There's a negative energy inside. It's got to get out. Right. So, you know, it's going to come out through writing. Mm. It's going to come out through speaking. Or it's going to come out through my puppet, right? It's got to come out in some way. And... Hopefully that wasn't too graphic for the audience. But the, <laughs> the energy's got to the room, like everything changed when I said that. But the, the energy's got to come out in some way. And I found for me, and everyone has to find their ways. Some people, it's hitting the gym. But it's not things that distract from it. It's not, oh, let me get the energy out in, a, By in an indirect right. way. Right. That's, that doesn't do it because the energy, that, that is still in there energetic, energetically. So if I'm feeling some sort of negative feeling, a, I don't know, something triggered my self-esteem and I'm feeling down about myself, then I want to write about that specifically. I want to speak to someone about that specifically. Mm. Or else that energy needs to get released. Okay, you say that again, the point that, that it's, it's the energy behind why you're doing it. Correct. Right. Right. What is the reason? And that's why I said the very first step is the awareness of it. Right, you have to be you attuned to, to your feeling first. Right, you have to be yeah. attuned. Right, yeah. one of the most difficult parts of addiction is that it numbs us so deeply. Hmm. So people are walking around a bubble. You talk to them about these things, and you say, you realize you have a low self-esteem. They don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what are you? So I feel good about myself. You don't feel anything. You haven't felt a feeling in years. Wow. We're just numb. We're walking around numb because every single time a feeling comes up, we escape, numb, or distract with, with something else. And if you have an addiction, that's the purpose of the addiction is to numb that pain. So I'm hearing these terms at the beginning, and I don't know what anyone's talking about, but eventually you get some space between the addiction and where we are today and then real feelings start coming up not what we imagine to be feelings but actual real feelings you know from from inside us and then we got to deal with those we got to deal with those or it's going to drive us right back to the the addiction okay if i if i could just end with one more question because i know we're short on time um you mentioned on the podcast with Robert jacobson something about a goodbye letter and a thank you letter Mm -hmm. Do you mind to repeat yourself for the people who are listening? Yeah, so I put that as one as one letter. Um, actually, and maybe this would be a good note to uh, to end on. So I've pretty much everyone I've worked with um, who's from a from background, who's looking to um, overcome porn addiction. I've had them write two letters at some point in time. Not you know from day one necessarily. They do both, but over time, there were two letters. One was a thank you slash goodbye letter, right? Same letter. You know, imagine you have a friend come over to your house, and you had a difficult period in your life, and he's there for you. But now you got a wife and kids, and the guy's still there, right? So you don't want to say, like, you know, I don't know why 
you ever came here? You're such a bad person. No, thank you. Like you came at a very important time, but you've always said you're welcome. It's been it's been 15 years. Like hello, I got four kids, and you're still sleeping in the guest room. What's going on? But that's literally what addiction is. If we look at the time, a lot a lot of us we want to beat ourselves up for for the addiction, how bad it is, especially if it violates Allah in some way, or goes against our sensibilities. But if we look about if we look at when it was formed, it was formed in a very at a very necessary time in a very useful way it could have been the most important thing we did at that point in time to get through our situation and that's why sometimes it's so hard to shake so for example when um, I don't know we have soldiers in Vietnam and they figure out there's some drug they can take every single night it can be the difference between life and death that, that drug the fact that they're taking that drug at night is not the problem because in that in that setting they're in a crazy setting they need to do something just to stay alive. So they found that there's some drug that they can take, so they start taking it. But And this is actually the case with many soldiers in Vietnam, but then they come back home and they stop because they're not in that circumstance anymore. For many of us addicts, it's the same thing. We started, for me, when I started watching pornography and more than watching, but leaning on it and de- de- being dependent on it, I was, at a ver- I was in a very precarious situation as a teenager, feeling that I had no one to turn to, all of these problems inside me and here I had something that can numb them and put them to bed for a little while and it's not a bad thing at that point it in filled time, a need at the it time it filled a very important need maybe a life or death need I don't know what I would have done with those feelings if I didn't have the ability to numb it but now I'm not 12 years old and I I don't I, I have tools resources abilities that I didn't have then for me to I'm not in Vietnam anymore right and why am I still taking that You're job war. so when someone comes to me and they're talking about their addiction, I'm not aware I like that. When someone comes to me and they're talking about their addiction, and like I hate my addiction, it's going to be a very tough place to, to, come from, to come from. What did your addiction really do for you? And most likely, when it started, it filled a very, very, very useful and important need. And if you can go back into your story, otherwise we wouldn't develop it. Why would we develop it? Why would we allow ourselves for, um, to, to go back there at the beginning stages? We weren't addicted then. Why we go right? The first time we did it, we weren't addicted. It took a little bit for us to get there. What was going on in our life? And it actually made. We'll almost uniformly find that it'll, it made a lot of sense at that time. People talk about genetic. You know, alcoholism is genetic. It's not genetic. That's there may be some genetic predisposition. Right. right. I, I've never. The reason I say it's not genetic categorically is because I've never met anyone who's an who's an addict who doesn't have a crazy story. The amount of kids who were sexually abused and became sex addicts, I mean, it's a very high percentage. I'm not saying it's the only way someone can become a sex addict, but it's It's divorce, uh, trauma, health issues, all sorts of stuff that people deal with. And then, yeah, they develop an addiction. At that time, was necessary. So to be able to say thank you slash goodbye, it's so much more compassionate to ourselves, and it works a lot better. And your friend is more likely to leave if you say thank you. Right. right. <laughs> I was like, dude, I was there when you needed me, and now you're just throwing me out of the house. Like, I know you were there. I'm saying thank you. We're just like, it's time for you to move on and me to move on. So that's the first. And the second letter that I've recommended almost everyone write, right? and I can't say if this extends to people who are not from a firm background, but certainly people from a firm background, um, is, and I wasn't so formal when I delivered the letter the first time, but it was, I'm extremely upset at you, Hashem. Right? And you can use your own imagination for the way I would have articulated in a less formal way. The reason I suggest it is because normally there's a ton of anger that we've developed. And I'm not going to say it, um, it. It could be that it goes beyond the firm community, but it's certainly for, for us. And in some ways it could feel like we were set up in some way. So I, I, I felt like that, and I've heard this kind of theme in a lot of people's stories, is at the end of the day, if I'm being truthful, this is the thing that saved me. This is what I needed. And then here I am learning these things, how I'm creating a holocaust every time I, uh, every time I go in this direction. right? There are all sorts of horrible laws, horrible things that are going to happen to me from porn and masturbation and everything else. So I'm set up. Like You put me in a circumstance where I had almost no solution other than to do this. I was doing my best in a lot of other ways and then I'm hearing all of these things that are so terrible it can and anger can form toward, towards God the other thing is that we're told that he's in control of everything and a lot of us are very unhappy about our life so what happens is 
is that when we start our day, baruch atah this, baruch atah that, it just, it's, it's the, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but it sets the foundation for a very toxic, a very false relationship. Right. So oftentimes, start, start, write this letter, not, write this letter if that's what you feel, meaning if that's what you feel, God is big enough. He can handle it. Meaning, in, mm. if, meaning it's almost like instead of, you know, going through the motions, if this is how you feel about something, Express like it. Express Meaning it. The, Expl- right. And I'm, I'm sure I offended someone when I suggest this. Let me explain <laughs> what I'm saying. What I'm suggesting is that we need to have a real relationship with a God, with a higher power, if we're going to get out of addiction. That's the, that, that, that's the way it works. The 12 steps is all based on that. Right. So people can sugarcoat it. People can dance around it. The 12 steps is based on the fact, if you look at the early letters of Carl Jung, the, the famous therapist at the time with Bill Wilson, who was a founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, he basically said that there's... <laughs> The types of alcoholics who regular treatment doesn't work for. The types of addicts now can be extended to who regular treatment doesn't work for. And the only people who've seen heal is people who've made a profound spiritual shift in their life. And their life became one where they, they had a strong personal relationship with a higher power. And now I'm using some of my own words. But there's a strong personal relationship with a higher power. And you feel directed and cared for by this higher power. So I ask you, if someone is feeling angry towards God, but they've been told that they can't even express this anger because God's going to punish them or it's a chal Hashem or all the other languages that's used. we use, you don't have a real relationship and you can't get sober. So if that's where you're at now, God is big enough. He can handle it. Moshe yelled at him, so to the others, he can handle it. Okay, so that sets the foundation for a real relationship and a real conversation. And some of my journal entries will start hey, addressed to a higher power. And the solution and the real healing comes when we say, oh, wow, there's been a higher power who's been directing me, who's been with me, who's been side by side with me in my darkest times and now in my better times. And that knowledge and that relationship is what pushes us forward and keeps us sober. But we can't do that if we don't have a dialogue. If we're not, yeah, yeah, we don't have a dialogue. It's not honest. If someone doesn't feel like they can be honest with their higher power, with God, with the only thing they can say is Baruch HaTah Hashem, when they're feeling anything but Baruch HaTah Hashem, they're not going to get sober. So those are the two letters that I almost um, always uh, recommend. And very quickly, people are not saying thank you to porn. Or, right. Right. Thank you. They're saying goodbye. Right. Right. They're not saying thank you every day. But it's not my relationship today. It's one of closeness and one of feeling that I have a higher power who cares about me, is directing me, and this is my way of giving back and thanking Him for what he's done. Wow. Thank, you so thank you so much. Really, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for listening or watching to this week's episode. I mean, it's always incredible to speak to anyone who gave a TED Talk. I mean, like, that's that's pretty darn cool. So we were really excited to meet him, and Ellie did not let us down. This was a really insightful and powerful episode, and we even spoke to him for, like, 30 minutes after, um, which we're thankful for. And if you are listening to this and – you are addicted, you have an issue, you have a challenge, it could be everything or anything, you could call our friends at Relief for help. Their number is, they have a lot of numbers, but I'm gonna give you their New York office number, 718-431-9501. That's 718-431-9501. Or you can send them an email at info at reliefhelp.org. And if you would like to reach out to Ellie, I'm not sure if he wants his information public, but I will include in the show notes what we could include. And until next time, please stay safe. Living L'chaim.